Hey there, I'm Stella and welcome to the Block 101 podcast, where you'll find the brightest minds and projects from the emerging tech industry. Today, I have the pleasure to speak with Sean Elul. Sean is the co-founder of Metaverse Architect and a heavy gamer at heart with over 2000 hours played on Minecraft. Let's jump in. Hi Sean, thank you so much for making it here. How are you today? It's a pleasure to be here and it's, it's awesome. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm excited to talk <laughs> a, a little bit about uh, the metaverse and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You literally jumped out of bed for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I did. It's been a long night of coding and, and put, putting different modular pieces of code <laughs> together, but it's, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. So please tell us a little bit about the metaverse, about your experience in the metaverse, about uh, Metaverse Architect. So, uh, starting with Metaverse Architects, it's, uh, we're basically a company that primarily works B2B in providing solutions to, to businesses with regards to getting to the interfaces and building out 3D immersive environments for them. We effectively help companies and help brands, organizations, individuals in recognizing the opportunities that arise with disruptive technologies such as the Metaverse and shifting um, our partners or these organizations or individuals towards a, a position where they can change potential disruptive risk into opportunity risk. So we build out different strategies, means to be able to build out these experiences for these companies and actually allow them to be able to make the most of the metaverse industry. Okay. Um, and so, sorry I cut you, but the companies that you work with are mostly Web2 companies trying to get into Web3 or Web3 companies that need a little bit of advice to get into the metaverse. This is such an interesting question because in truth, we have such a diverse clientele. So we have anyone from rappers and singers to UFC fighters and boxers to large institutional banks to extremely large accounting firms to um, NGOs, for example, working with veterans to food based companies to large supermarket conglomerates to real estate developers to government entities yeah. and policy oriented entities, um, journalist uh, entities and news agencies. It's incredible. We have, there's a use case for anyone. So it's, it's kind of akin to us being starting a company in the early 90s and building websites. There yeah. isn't really a specific um, company that you could you need to work with because in truth if you can think it you can build it and with regards to building out a website you can bring value to almost any kind of company and it's very similar in the metaverse as well where there is a use case for almost any problem or any brand or any experience it's more about tweaking the project so that the KPIs make sense for then the business goals of that organization or the, the intent of, of the individual or entity or, or uh, whatnot. So it's extremely diverse, which is what makes it yeah, exciting. Yeah, I see. <laughs> I see that. I love that, uh, that sentence that you said that if you, think, if you can think it, you can build it. It's uh, very nice. Totally. And that's one of the, the most liberating parts of the metaverse mm -hmm. as a concept. It's creativity and uh, 100 percent yeah in, in truth one of the most like unifying factors that we see in most of our builds is the the element of gamification where you are providing some degree of gamification to a build and in truth the gamification aspect is rooted in interactivity mm -hmm. you're providing a, a dynamic interactive space for people to enjoy and play with and uh, the whole aim behind that is just being creative there's we're in a recording studio right now, right? Like, hypothetically, if we were to recreate this in the metaverse, it would make sense to just create four walls around. Like, why not place it in space or in the Caribbean or on Mars or on Titan? Or like, the beach. Yeah, exactly. I love the difference between us here, <laughs> the sea at the beach. I'm like, let's go to one of Saturn's moons. <laughs> yeah, and the funny thing is, we live on an island, so there's literally beach exactly. everywhere. So, see, I'm not like that creative. I like to stay in my. <laughs> But that's the, the fun part, where you get to think outside of the box. Um, one big headache we have right now, and it's a headache, a good kind of headache to have. Um, we're working on, on concerts in the metaverse with some of the largest names in the music industry. Okay. And one genuine challenge we're facing is, how can we reimagine the concert experience? And it's, most of our work is trying to reverse engineer how we do things on a day-to-day -day basis, whether real life events or our current digital events, um, trying to think of new ways in which how we capture people's attention, what our interaction of, with brands or celebrities or anything of the sort is rooted in, and then trying to find a new means to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So one big conversation we're internally having right now is 
what should a concert look like in the metaverse? Should it even be a concert? Should it be an evolution of a music video instead? And all these different moving parts are, are really interesting to play around with and to liberate yourself in a way that you're not just rinse and repeating the same thing when you're no longer constricted by the physical realm and the physics that we're used to. It's it's quite difficult to wrap your head around. From a creative <laughs> yeah, standpoint. I can imagine you have a, <laughs> none of your days look look alike in this uh, in this case. It's really cool because instead of just thinking of. Um, of building something new, you really have to take into consideration what's already existing and kind of dive in into the experience as it is now to be to be fully innovative. Totally, and we're we're in quite a lucky position now because we've scaled as a company over. We're, we're quite a young company, but we've managed to to scale quite well over the last year. Um, so now we're in a position where we also choose our clients. It's it's a two way decision if that makes sense, and we do generally try to opt for clients that are ambitious and want to create something new, where it's not just a rinse and repeat mechanism. It's more than that. It's about creating a new experience that pushes the boundaries of what's possible, even if it's just a little bit, but there needs to be some spark, some idea that's mm -hmm. like, okay, that's a cool approach. This is something new. This is something different. We need to ideate over here. And what are you guys building concretely? Because for me, Metaverse Architects, I, I was thinking it would be more like uh, stadiums or uh, venues or buildings. That's a really good question. And uh, have you seen The Matrix by any chance? Yeah, of course. So like in, in The Matrix, when they talk about the creator of The Matrix, mm -hmm. they talk about the, that individual as an architect. Mm -hmm. And when, so when meta, like Decentraland Architect, Metaverse Architect is something my co-founder Luca actually coined. He was one of the first people to be writing on the internet about this concept of a Metaverse Architect. Um, and when we were brainstorming with regards to building this portfolio, that was something we took inspiration from. Because in the digital sense, an architect is much less about just creating structures um, in a 3D sense, but much more about creating an entire digital infrastructure and framework to be able to build a world. Mm -hmm. So in, in traditional architecture, an experience is rooted in, in stone or in wood or erecting a, a building, a structure basically that encapsulates a specific experience. In the digital realm, it's much more than that. You have 3D architecture, you have texturing, you have sound engineering, you have um, coding. In, in our case, you have blockchain-based coding as well. You have the implementation of physics engines. You have the gamification aspect. There's multiple moving parts that bring this whole experience together. So when we say metaverse architect, it's not just a 3D asset. There's much more going on. Uh, You're building the new matrix. And uh, maybe not that far, like I hope not as well, like to a, to a certain degree. But yes, like that's where the inspiration is that the, the digital realm that we are manipulating is malleable and we're constantly molding it towards creating these new experiences that we'd like to see there. Um, so the architecture process is extremely broad, moving from 3D design to texturing to sound engineering to uh, very heavy based coding as well and obviously even the integration of different blockchain based code as well with regards to either and I would like to ask you, what evolutions have you seen in the past two years about the metaverse and, and where also do you think we're going in the, what's going to be the, the major trends for the next years? That's a really good question. Um, so my exposure to the concept of the metaverse started with um, Ready Player One. Um, so I love this movie. <laughs> I was book. going to talk about it actually. The book is phenomenal. So it's it's the book that I, I like read the book a few years before the movie came out, and I think you'd love it because what really impacted me about the book is it's extremely heavy, especially in the first like third of the book, on how this technology impacted education and gave education for all, and also provided um, a framework to be able to bring internet access to all and even access to these devices to all. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important point because the first primary factor that we'd have to address from an industry perspective is accessibility. So the development of the hardware is incredibly important. We can't kid ourselves without recognizing that there's a large portion of the planet that does not yet have access to the internet. The metaverse as a concept does not necessarily mean that you need to have a virtual headset because the metaverse as a concept is actually quite broader than that. It's 
very much rooted into the 3D environment, yes, and having a 3D immersive space. Um, however, it it's requires structures like interoperability, so seamless movement between different virtual, uh, virtual worlds and virtual spaces, seamless movement of assets, seamless movement of information, data ownership and how data ownership is structured. Um, data sovereignty, in fact, as a consequence of data ownership. As an internet user, do you have the right to own your data instead of large conglomerates owning it for you? These are all hurdles that we're slowly going to be facing that are usually under the hood hurdles, but they're so important to the, the structure that we're building. Um, the development of DAOs is also a big one, and what governance structures we're implementing in different decentralized autonomous organizations. It's very embryonic at the moment, but the ideas being shared in these spaces are potentially going to set the foundations for the next five, seven years of, of how these technologies are going to be run. Um, so to bring it back, because I, <laughs> there's a lot of things happening, and the hardware is incredibly important, but then there's a lot of things happening from a decision-making process that are going to impact the entire industry. And those yes. are a lot of under-the-hood stuff because it's still embryonic. So. Yeah, and you also mentioned the education, which is very important. I think this, that applies of, for all areas of Web3, for blockchain, for crypto, for NFTs, Metaverse as well. Um, I like that you talked about the fact that some people still think that in, in order to access the Metaverse, you need this Oculus headset or the Meta... Well, you know, it's a, it's kind of a fake belief that proves how little understanding we have of this world yet. So yeah, the education part is, is tremendously important. And I really do believe it's going to have a massive impact on society because currently we cater to two kinds of learning patterns in with Web2. The first is reading based and information based. Open up Wikipedia, go through it, consume information. Personally, that's how I like to consume information. Just reading, highlighting, getting what I need there fast. Okay. We also cater for audiovisual learning, with YouTube video, podcast, ebook, get that information while you're on the go. We need to now cater for kinesthetic learning. Yes. And that still hasn't been effectively done. With haptic gloves, uh, just like the Oculus Quest, for example, or the Oculus Quest 2, and the VR headset, you can provide the next level of potential learning in that regard. What we currently lack is environments that react to the user and that the user can manipulate freely. So for example, learning about physics by immersing yourself in a physics engine and being able to, for example, I'll, I'll never forget in my physics class when our teacher taught us that gravity is the same irrespective of the size of the object. Like it's always going to be the same acceleration to the floor, obviously catering for air resistance and whatnot. So like a big basketball and a tiny marble would, should fall at the same rate. Tests like that could be so easily given to a multitude of different young people around. And that's just a very simple, stupid example. Like we could have a lecture on Greek philosophy, like right in an agora in Athens and actually see the trial of Socrates happening before our eyes and hear his great speech before he had to eat, like drink hemlock. Like these are things that are made possible. Uh, with these immersive spaces. Uh, we have two major problems in our education systems today. Is the first is standardization with regards to treating young people and students as if they are products in a manufacturing system. Standardizing a human being to meet specific requirements that barely even caters for the problems of the real world in an archaic system. And not to mention the reliance on regurgitation on the age of the internet, when today we can answer any question by simply pulling out our phones. So that's problem one. Problem two is accessibility. Um, you depend on the teacher relaying the information to you. You depend on the country you're born in and the form of educational infrastructure they have built. The metaverse allows us to automate that process in a new way, where you can now start ex reaching more students, but also building out gamified experiences that young people can experience in perpetuity, where you no longer need a middleman or a teacher being there present for every single student. You can create an automated system to be able to just teach and allow young people to experiment and to solve problems, which is so much more important than shoving information down their throat. Yes, yes. And I think also for providing opportunities to people all around the world, as we were talking about a bit before, we we're talking about Africa. Um, 
now, as you mentioned, for the United States or other countries, and I also is the case for, for France, where you go depends on so many things, depends on your resources, depends on where you are geographically. But with the metaverse, what I really see is the opportunity to bring the same opportunities to everyone all around the world. And that's what I find personally super interesting. And it's, it's, this is something I've, I've been meditating on recently, but it's so important that we, we remember that the metaverse is an iteration or an evolution of the internet. And if you take the perspective of looking at individual humans as nodes of information that are sharing information with each other and looking at the human species as a collection of all that information, as, as us trying to identify where we want to go as literally a species, the internet is the only technology that, or the only technology that managed to connect us at this exponential rate where it's yes limited limited by the infrastructure would build but the limitations as opposed to spoken word radio television writing uh, the printing press the internet has provided us a new way to be able to s store data communicate data check data reference each other towards just growing our, our global ambition with regards to how we can cooperate and build. The metaverse comes out of that, just like social media comes out of that, YouTube comes out of that, PayPal comes out of that, Revolut comes out of that. Like The fact that now I can get food delivered to me right over here with a very easy to use app, all these things are a consequence of this phenomenal technology we've created. 90% mm -hmm. of the things I'm telling you right now are a consequence of the internet. As someone who grew up with an internet connection, I had access to information. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't limited to just learning from either my school or a library in Brizerbu, just a village in the south of Malta that has a tiny room for a library. And I'd like to jump back on something you, you mentioned. You mentioned the ownership of data and how important that is. Um, what do you think of the centralized metaverses versus decentralized metaverses? That's a very good question. I think anyone that is... so. Again, taking it back to grounded theory, the concept of a centralized metaverse just it doesn't make sense from the perspective of uh, how academics deal with the term metaverse. Okay. So, for example, uh, Kim Nevelstein would say that Decentraland is not a metaverse. Sandbox is not a metaverse. It's a virtual world or a virtual galaxy to that regard. The metaverse as a concept is so much bigger and uh, that requires infrastructure, interoperability financial interoperability, um, interoperable movement between most spaces. It's, it's kind of like a network, the, the internet or something. It's more of a concept rather than uh, something tangible we can get to. The industry obviously started using the term metaverse like completely fine. Um, but even when trying to define what's going on, uh, it's, it's these, these things need to be it, we, we're often not talking about the same things because everyone has different definitions, which is, which is weird in that regard. But data is so important because in Web2, you don't own your data. Facebook makes money from your data. Like, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product, essentially. Now, this issue arose from a multitude of different things. Like from my perspective, I, I feel that we did not realize how much of a problem data can become and using that data for ulterior agendas until it actually started happening and having an impact. Now we're aware. One of the most important things I feel towards not the metaverse, but Web3, the evolution of Web3 is decentralized ownership, new unparalleled levels of accountability, transparency, and immutability. Data on the internet is a key part of that. So what I'm hoping to see is an evolution with regards to how you could own your own data and have data sovereignty. And then with regards to centralization and decentralization of different metaverses, it's, it's akin to having something that's open source and closed source. Any platform, let's take Horizon Worlds, for example, so the product of Meta with regards to what they're planning to build. Um, we don't know what it's going to look like in the next 10 years, but it's very likely going to be not open source, very closely controlled by Meta. Um, that limits them from the perspective of being able to build out infrastructure with regards to connecting to every other experience. So if 
Decentraland, for example, is building out infrastructure so that it can interoperably connect to every other experience, suddenly they're losing out. What's interesting, though, however, with, with these technologies is that that interoperability can be achieved by Internet users independently of Meta or any conglomerate, um, which is why technologies like IPSME are so interesting, or the, the question of interoperability is one that's very interesting because it provides agency to, to literally the consumer to be able to solve these problems without even having to ask the conglomerate for for them to actually cater for it. You could build a client that seamlessly moves between all those different metaverse spaces, for example. I think the question that these, these conglomerates will have to face is to what degree are they going to give their community ownership? And personally, I believe as we scale our competence with regards to how, to, how we can use blockchain-based technologies, how we can use DAOs in our favor, what decentralization actually means and a community-led organization actually looks like, they will suffer if they don't react. Because th there would be a, a clear, like, to link this to, to Sigma, maybe it would be interesting. One interesting rise we're seeing in, in Decentraland at the moment is the rise of decentralized casinos. Yes. Owned by the players for the players, the players having a DAO voting on the future of that casino, taking decision makings on their behalf, and they take a percentage of the profits at the end of every month. Extremely interesting concept. How is that going to change the game? In truth, it's very hard to know. Um, but the, the concept of decentralization is one I personally am willing to bet on. And what is one of the use cases of Metaverse that excites you the most personally? We're launching uh, uh, the first mental health clinic in the metaverse on October 11th for World Mental Health Day. I think that's wow. going to be really, really exciting because the quantitative data is already showing that it, it's already being useful to multiple different traditional patients in the mental health industry. And we're building out this uh, with our partners, MindEasy, uh, who are amazing. Um, we're building out this AI robot, basically, where the have you ever been to an audiovisual room by any chance? No. Like, so it, this is basically like you have an AI robot that is taking you through provisions for mental health first okay. aid. So like first contact if you're having a panic attack or if you're suffering from, uh, we've listed about five different situations you could be in. And as you are answering questions with this AI bot, the entire room around you dynamically begins to morph and change according to the condition you find yourself in. Okay. So the colors of the room change, change, like change dynamically. The roughness and edges of the architecture change. Brown noise starts to play in the background, like subtly coming in. If you're doing a breathing exercise, the room breathes with you to give you that feeling effect of, of being able to fight the claustrophobia or the anxiety. Wow. It's extremely... That sounds amazing, actually. It's... it's, it's it is, it is, and not because we're building it. Uh, like, as I would be a patient of it as well. Like, I do suffer from anxiety. So, uh, as I imagine it, I do understand how much it could help with regards to being able to ground yourself and have a moment of mindfulness. Because with that level of immersion, the room, the entire environment is dedicated towards helping you alleviate that tension or, or get through that moment, basically. Um, and that's exciting. That's exciting. Um, so, uh, and it's just a prototype, it's just a start. So uh, even with regards to education, for example, I've seen really interesting, um, really interesting apps on the Oculus that attempt to educate you on what suffering from schizophrenia is like. And this is so important for, for the sector of, of mental health with regards to destigmatization and just raising awareness with yes, regards to what can be done. Helping people empathize. Totally. There's, and so, I find that incredibly interesting. Also, education has to be one of the, the things that I'm, I'm most excited about, but that is such a, a difficult situation to grasp and, and to tackle and to deal with, that it's one that I'm just excited to be following and maybe contributing to in the future. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for the education, earlier you were talking about different skill, the different types of learning, right? The visual learners, audiovisual, the uh, auditive learners and the kinesthetic ones. And for me too, I'm a 100% kinesthetic learner. So this is also something I'm super excited about for the metaverse. Totally. And, and it's also just really smart, even for research and development processes, mm -hmm. for example. The fact that you can create these these environments and have an infinite amount of resources where you can tweak physics constantly, where 
you're you're not limited by the amount of materials you have in the real world. It can just exponentially drive research if we build these things right. So any young individual from across the planet can be given a problem, such as I don't know, creating more efficient solar panels and shooting a random one. Um, given all the information they need to be able to know how to build a solar panel, given all the engineering-based components in that environment allow them to kinesthetically manipulate them as they deem fit. They're given the information, the, the lecturing, the, the breakdown of all the schematics, all the materials required, plus any other material that might be available to them that they could potentially want to use to build that out. And suddenly you provide that to anyone that has an interest. And you're giving them the information they need, the tools they need, the materials they need, and they can just ideate based on their on their passions, on their interests, on, on their curiosity. That's what decentralization is all about. And I'm just, I really want to see what's going to happen when we manage to create that. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And so from a business perspective, I'm not going to ask you what are the opportunities for the materials because I, I think you must have had that question a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot. But what industries do you see um, coming to play in the metaverse because we've had so many things we had the fashion industry we had can i ask you a question yes like of if if i was interviewing you and this was the mid 90s and i asked you what industries do you think the internet is going to impact and now with your perspective in 2022 it's very hard to answer yes it is because it of is. the broad nature of that. and i do fundamentally believe mm -hmm. the metaverse is the same and the the variety of clients we have is a testament to that. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in truth, again, if you can think it, we can build it. Um, <laughs> and the reason why that is something we say internally is because there is almost a use case for anything. Uh, you can gamify anything. You can um, create a tree, the experience that's immersive and teaching people in a different way for almost any piece of information or to the interface. Um, which regards to then looking at it from an industry perspective and what the next big thing would be. Uh, personally, I'm excited for the, the Quest 2 Pro that's coming out earlier this year by Meta. Okay. The reason why I'm excited for that is because it's the first time they're implementing eye trackers into a VR headset. I know that sounds scary. Um, data tracking is something that we seriously need to consider, especially with the use of something like a Fitbit as well. Um, so Amazon is already like playing very dangerously in this regard, but all the worries aside, this would be the first time in human history where we can communicate with anyone from around the world and actually have eye-to-eye -eye contact in that communication in a digital sense. When you have a FaceTime or a WhatsApp video call, you I don't know if you ever realized, even when we're on a Zoom call, it's hard to feel like you're making eye contact with the person because you either need to look into the camera or you're looking at the screen or sometimes you're just looking at yourself. Like it's, it's I difficult. do that a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's very normal. It's very human with regards to just like you, there's you over there and that's how you look like and you're just subconsciously like feeling like you're being displayed rather than being immersed in a conversation, which is important. And this would be the first time from a digital sense where we're going to be able to interact with eye to eye contact. Um, where facial expressions are also felt a little bit more. And I, I think that's going to have an interesting effect on, on just how we interact in these spaces to begin with. I think that's the next interesting step. This is fantastic. I had actually no idea about this project. I will definitely look it up. Yeah, it's like a, it's Meta's like a VR headset. It's mm -hmm. coming out later this year. And what advice would you give to a company that tries to, to make it in the metaverse, that tries to have the next big original idea um, try to succeed in this environment, if we can really call it success. I mean, um, or, or rather, should I put it, what advice would you give to a company that tries to establish themselves in the metaverse? Go to metaversearchitects.com, like shoot us an email. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, but uh, jokes aside. If you had to give three pieces of advice. <clears throat> Good. So point number one, why are you making this move? break it down, understand what exactly you're going to gain from this. Do you want to, is it a marketing play? Is it an extension of your sales funnel? Um, do you actually want to hedge against potential disruptive risk? Are you taking an investment-based approach? Do you want to do R&D? Do you want to uh, 
uh, hire more people from it. There's a multitude of different solutions. You just want to run events, like are you an events-based company? Are, are you a boxer and you want to organize boxing matches in the metaverses? Multiple use cases in that regard. So first, identify your measurable KPIs and understand why the hell you're doing this. So why are you doing this? And then you must apply measurable KPIs. I think that would be the second one. So once you understand why you're doing this, then you're going to want to take a quantitative approach. So what is my return on this investment? What is my return on this branch? And that is a consequence of identifying what the solution for you actually is. So again, if it's just marketing, then your main KPI is going to be traffic and, and people actually coming in the space. If it's hiring or onboarding more users, then it's going to require much more levels of interactivity within that set build. Um, to be able to have a degree of conversion. So identify those KPIs, very traditional in these sense. Third one, think outside the box, take gamification extremely seriously. Um, one big uh, quantitative piece of information like data that I can share is that although traffic compared to most Web2 experiences is quite low comparatively, so if you were to run an ad on on Instagram to reach 1 million people, it's easier to be able to do that than to get 1 million people to your property in the metaverse. However, the customer retention, the user retention time that we see in the metaverse is unparalleled compared to anything else, compared to TV ads, radio ads, uh, Instagram ads, anything. So the average amount of time someone would spend looking at an ad on Instagram is approximately two to four seconds. Mm -hmm. um, anything above four seconds, like 10 seconds, you actually can think that you might make a conversion in that regard. The average time we see in the metaverse is approximately eight minutes and 30 seconds. Wow, eight minutes. That's, that's huge. What, what explains that difference, actually? Because you're immersed in a 3D environment, in a gamified environment. So you're you're not force-fed information in a pre-prepared ad or video. You're encouraged to explore an environment that's built around your KPIs and your business goals. Makes sense. And the consumer is put in a position where they're not just sitting down and information is being transmitted to them, but rather they're entering a tailor-made custom design space, mm -hmm. um, a custom design space that we build to fulfill the business goals of our clients and achieve specific KPIs. Mm -hmm. and then built in a gamified, immersive, creative experience that allows them to be engaged with the brand in a way that's never really been done before. I see. Well, thank you very much. And what's the best way to follow up with you guys' update and your work? Uh, you can follow us at, at MetaArcs on all social media platforms. Um, and that's the best way to, to check us out. Or you can go to our website, metaversearchitects.com, and just see our, like, our, our latest builds popping up. Thank you so much for your time, Sean. It was a pleasure having you here. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you.